Thank you very much, Marta. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And as Marta said at the beginning, we're going to talk about Chile and this rise of social movements and the decline of the political class. Um, and what is going on today with our civil society and the political, political and public scene in, within our country. So in this sense, I would like to share with you a little bit of background, uh, why this all uh, concern about our educational system arise, and um, how our civil society has been continuously being activated since 2006. But all this started uh, more back in the 90s, uh, specifically in 1988, when after having 17 years of dictatorship in Chile, um, people were called to vote for yes or no, yes to continue having the dictator in power, and no for finishing with the dictatorship after, after 17 years. So why I want to show you this video is because a lot of analysts and experts on this topic of educational movements in Chile have been comparing what happened at the beginning of the 1990s with this plebiscite and kind of the sense of the people that they wanted a change in Chile, that they were claiming for more opportunities, that were kind of thinking about the future. As you can see here, highlighted some keywords. They wanted to have success by, by protesting and going outside and sharing home goals. So I will show you now the video, part of the video of the campaign of that year in 1988. So people Why? Uh, 
Now, he ratified all the democracy established by Patricio Elvin in the previous government and started to develop all the uh, macroeconomy and alliance with potential markets like Asia, Europe, and United States. And in the internal area, uh, he started to build this alliance with private sector and the state uh, in different, uh, for example, transportations and other topics to get better the country. In this, uh, in this government, in the fray, appeared uh, for the first time a minister, called Michel Bachelet, who will be, who will talk later. Then appeared Ricardo Lago, the next president. We call them the statesman. Ricardo Lago uh, uh, appeared like a president and ratified all the agreements with United States, China, and, and Europe, this free agreement trade uh, advanced in the infrastructure, and Michel Bachelet was the Minister of Defense in this period. In 2006, <laughs> appeared Michel Bachelet, a very, uh, our first, uh, President woman, one percent, and we call her the accident. Why the accident? Because uh, in the coalition, the group of parties who she represented appear a politicians with a very big charisma, and she was only the only woman who will be able to confront Sebastián Piñera in the opposition, and beat him in the election. And a very nice characteristic of Bachelet is the proximity with the people, and the, the people feel re very represented by her. In her government, she promoted the social programs, and she led uh, the, the government with uh, approval of more than 80%. Uh, a topic, very important topic here, in her terms, started the Penguin Revolutions. It's the educational, educational reform, and Catalina will talk more about that. Well, the Penguin Revolution, uh, that's the name of the social, the big social movement that started to activate by 2006 in Batilet's term. And here is when I would say that civil society exploded. There were two main factors that made students to go out to the streets and protest and maintain this march throughout the whole year and the upcoming years. So the two main factors that uh, started this, this conflict was that they, uh, the government was raising the price of the national exam for high school students. So uh, once uh, they were graduating from high school, they had to take this exam, but there were a lot of barriers because uh, people that did have money or came with uh, from wealthy families, they could afford it. But those who were more vulnerable, they had to struggle to pay the test and be part of the system. So that was one factor. And the other one was the restriction of the school pass. So it was supposed to be used without any restriction during the whole day, but then the government said that it will be only used twice a day. So this is why students started to go out and protest. And then the discussion led to more uh, structural reforms. So it started like uh, the students claiming for uh, the government to increase, for example, the scholarships, to let them use the, the school pass during the whole day. And we will see how, as years are going through, the conversation is more focused now on, on reforming the entire system. So they were planning for free, free quality public education for all. So um, as we are going to see, our educational system is very money driven. So and OECD was releasing by that time a lot of reports that said that Chile has the most unequal education system in the world. So in Chile we have three types of school, public and private schools. And this third type of school that is 
uh, funded in a mixed way for, in the one hand, we have government subsidized, but a lot of, 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 of the fees that have to be paid for, for the children to be educated has to be afforded by the families. So the students realized that this third type of school uh, was leading to kind of a very rare educational system because it was not very clear what, what was happening with those funds that the government gave to these institutions because they were managed like in a more privatized way. And, and a lot of institutions also were making profit from the government's money. So they wanted to have a more equality in order to access to higher education and, uh, and with these huge debts that the families had by that time. So as I said, uh, this movement was led by high school students. The main symbol of the movement was the penguin, because you can see that how they were dressing was very similar. <laughs> 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 this was the most common scene, like every week in, in, in TV programs, in, in the press, print press. So this was kind of every week we had to see. Here is our presidential palace, and a lot of people gathered not only in the capital city, but this was a movement that was supported by all uh, Tiran regions. One of the characteristics of this movement was the Thomas, that it means tomar, and in English is to take. So the students, high school students, started to express themselves by putting chairs in front of the schools and, and to live, literally live inside the schools for more than six months. So you can see that uh, their education was completely free for a long time. And inside the, these uh, schools, they started to make assemblies, they started to organize, they started to structure the guidelines for taking further steps and kind of framework what, way, uh, what they were uh, doing um, and asking the government. So one of the ways, why do they do this also is because they wanted to pressure municipalities because in this third uh, type of school, municipalities were not able to receive funds if the students were not attending classes. So education was, for the first time, at the center of the public discussion. Uh, students were able to make education a national priority. And the, the movement itself expanded a lot. They received a lot of support of different organizations, like health uh, services, for example. Um, and environmental organizations, it was a very transversal social movement. And in general, and specifically, the, the students had two term goals, like short term goals, as I said, increasing school scholarships, um, kind of finishing with this high price of the national exam. And on the other hand, we have uh, their claim for changing and reforming the losses. The LOSE is a law that was signed by, by Augusto Pinochet, the dictator, in the 1990s, once he left uh, the presidential palace. And this law gives a lot of freedom for people who have educational in initiatives to build these kind of private institutions and to offer a lot of different programs to the students. So this led to a very weak system of regulation within all the educational system. And another uh, characteristic of the LOSE is that education is, is literally said that education has to be a responsibility from the parents and not a guarantee from the government. So in this sense, it kind of promoted this sense of privatization in T. Okay. This happens in the educational area. The government changed at new elections. Sebastián Piñera appeared like a candidate again. He was elected. And the, the civil society believed in a hope to give a solution to the educational issue and others, and choose Sebastián Piñera like a president and a shift to the right of the country. Uh, he was the first president 
the right president after the end of the, the military regime. But uh, the regime of Piñera was uh, remarked by natural disaster like a mega earthquake in 2010, the miners' issues in Atacama, but the students' protest still remains in this, all this government also. During his government, Piñera uh, created a commission to uh, study very deeply the educational uh, situation and analyze the system and confirm all the, the data finding or revealed uh, by all OCDE and confirm the difference between our our result with the average of the OCDE uh, system, the uh, OCDE level. At this time, our students uh, still remain with the some creative form of protest. Uh, one of them is uh, education in Chile is a work in that, and they create a flash mob about it. Here we will show you <laughs> more, more than 3,000 people dance here.
who was retired in a lot of different press articles from all over the world, they agreed to run around the presidential palace for 18,000 hours. So they started to run, for example, there is a, a student that ran for 10 hours without stopping, and another one that just ran 30 seconds. So they started to do to this, this type of pose. And the distance, they, it was the same as the distance in Santiago, in, in the south of Chile, from Santiago to Berlin, to Germany. And this was for 73 days they ran. So in this social movement, uh, arise a lot of new leaders. They were students uh, from university students. And nowadays, they are college deputies in our Congress. So in some way, we can see how the social and political uh, Capitalization of, of these uh, students kind of led them to occupy a seat in the Congress. So they were very like transversal. The, their backgrounds, they were two of them were not sympathizing with a specific political party, but the girls, for example, are militants of the Communist Party in Chile. These are some of the posters that travel all around the world. Um, here we can see that they say we're not terrorists, we're not criminal, we're just conscious students. Here, for example, I'm studying my second year and I have paid almost $10,000. And when I graduate, my debt will be around $30,000. And here is a father that's saying I wanted to give education to my kid, to my, to my son, but I only gave him a debt. So part of the analysis, uh, what was going on with, with this social movement and what was the current situation of the Chilean educational system. And, and this is happening nowadays for a bachelor program, in average, students must pay a tuition fee of $6,000. The GDP uh, of, of, of our country, just 2.4% is uh, used for supporting education, to supporting the, the, the system, and the, the support from the government, the public funding, is only 30% of that average, and 30% is being part of, uh, is coming from the pockets of uh, the families. So as we can see, because of the laws, because of what was done in, during the dictatorship, we can state that our educational system is highly privatized. The, the system to uh, regulate and fiscalize uh, our education is very weak because most of the education institutions uh, are being managed by private. So there's a lot of inequality and social segregation and a lot of financial burden on students and their families. So the public spending, for example, by 2011 um, was around 60% in the whole educational system, and only higher education was spent very little. Um, so there are additional problems also. It's not about uh, giving access and having more quality in education, but for example, what, ha what is happening with those students that can afford the debt, they can pay, so they can kind of uh, mix and, and, and divide their time to work in order to earn money and pay their debt and study. Uh, another issue is the desertion, for example. Uh, in our country, we have like 1.5 million students in the system, and near 6,000 of them have been deserted. Okay. With all, all these big prices, appear uh, all the environment, political environment are crisis, and the coalition of Michelle Bachelet uh, tried to seduce her to come back to be a candidate again. And she came from the United Women to give any credibility to her coalition and get uh, 
a, a final solution all, to all these statements, tax reform, educational reform, labor, and a new constitution. We are using the same constitution of military regime 30 years ago. Uh, the problem is uh, complex, I will talk later, uh, not how occur to get a good uh, port all in this statement. Okay. So this, for you to make a sense of how is uh, the social movement, like every every week people were gathering, this is kind of the, the central part, we could say, of Santiago de Capital City. Oh. So there are people gathered during 10 years, 10 whole years, this was the common scene there.
to kind of support 70% families, but still she's going to support the 50% of most vulnerable. This is this is one of part of the conflicts nowadays the Bichabachelet having in the government, but exist other topics. For example, the first minister was the minister for speculation tax reform plagiarism. Other example is President Sanz was involved in a case of privileged information called Casu Cavalli. And what of the result of that? Lack of legitimacy, legitimacy toward institution, politicians, and government, and the historical presidential uh, approval is 20% our days, and 27 the government. That uh, er erosion, all the the credibility of the one president in the first period in the first government uh, begins with a very high approval nowadays. It's just a 20%. So if we have to do an assessment of the student movement, we can clearly say that political participation exceeded institutional talents. So now the streets were being uh, main actors, main spaces for public discussion, political discussion. There was no more meetings inside, I mean, the Congress of Forest is continued functioning, but the streets was the main uh, sphere where all these discussions were held. Uh, the effect of social movement, of course, became more and more important uh, since 2006. We can say that our civil society is completely empowered, so they kind of give, give the guidelines day by day of what is going to be the agenda of the government. <laughs> And um, as I said before, this started as a student movement, but now you can see that there are a lot of different agendas from different sectors that have pledged to this movement, and they share a lot of, of, of goals, and they kind of make able to, to this social movement to begin massive and massive throughout all the years. Of course, there is a negative perception of the democracy system, Still, Chile, I could say, is the most stable country in South America regarding economics and regarding politics also. Although we have some cases, as Simon addressed before, where the son of the president was involved in an economical scandal, we have been witnesses a lot of politicians that were involved um, in the scandals, for example, the issuance uh, the issuance bills, for example, to pass uh, bills, they, they started passing bills to the Congress, but because they were commanded, being commanded by private institutions. So, as another result, for example, uh, and because of this new leadership, we can see in Chile how uh, the political sphere has been more. Um, so in the political pluralism, new leaders, new uh, new ideas, and also new political parties. So the students that started making the social movement, they are now current deputies, and they have created some political parties, like experts, national experts are saying that maybe someday one of them can become the next president of Chile. Our future challenge is strengthening the democracy through consolidations of social policies, lower economy, inequality, and concentration of wealth, increased social participation, social, cultural, community organizations, neighborhood, in political decision making systems. And of course, one of the major talents in Chile is to give full implementation of the educational reform. I mean, the hope of the entire society is to have free quality education for all and stop with this huge gap between those who have money and can afford a good education and the ones that only can go to a public uh, educational system. 
and if the public educational system had resources, maybe the discussion would be different. But nowadays, it's a huge gap between these two types of institutions and segmentation, a clear segmentation and discrimination towards those students that are not able to afford uh, education. And part of the challenges also that we didn't mention, but is important, is that there is still uh, a conflict going on in South of Chile with our native people there. Um, so it's part of the whole picture of the big picture that our current president is trying to give solution to this problem. And again, we would like to finish this presentation with our main symbol. I could say our main symbol is our civil society. Now they are leading the conversation, they are writing the agenda every day. So so this is already happening. The social movement is still being activated. They are not going out on the streets every single day, but the people are still organized and they have a lot of hope in this educational reform that is being implemented right now. Thank you very much. Question and answer because those events starting right up here at 12:30. But we have some time for a few quick ones. Yes. Yeah, I just I, I was awesome. I think it's great, but you can see also a lot of parallels between Chile and the United States. You know, Chile has been considered one of the, most, the wealthiest countries in Latin America, and it's part of the OECD for a reason. But uh, you can see that the, the, the same thing with the United States. You know, it's one of the, the wealthiest country in the world, but it's still most people are indebted because they went to private schools in most cases, mainly because the public schools are looked down upon by many people. But I think you can see a lot of similarities, and, and I think I find it very interesting that the social movements in Chile have achieved this, because Uruguay, when you look at the case of Uruguay, which for a couple decades, they have provided free education up to PhD to everyone, and that's where they have the most educated populations in Latin America. Um, and they have one of the best economies and governments and countries in Latin America. And many people don't talk about Uruguay, but it is the best example that I can find. But they also had the civil society back in the 80s, early 90s, after the dictatorships, pushing for these reforms, the labor movement, and all of them. And I feel like now it's happening to Chile, but in many countries that is not possible in Latin America. And I, I think that that is great that that's happening, but do you think up to 2020 they will be able to have free education for everyone, or how is that going to work? Honestly, maybe it will take more time, because now the country is growing uh, the growth, the national growth is only 1%. And when all this, these promises were made, the country was growing at a 3%. So it seems like with our economical scenario, things are going to become more slower, but hopefully it became a reality because you have one million students in higher education. And all of them have huge debts. All of them have to maybe drop out because they don't they are not able to continue studying. So as long as there are resources also, this can be made and, and even making it faster. But how we see now the picture, it seems like by 2020 is not going to happen. Also quickly, will the government forgive the debts like, for, for the students? Do you think, is there, is there, are there other calls from, from the population to have the government forgive the debts? That have been, because like the United States, I think it will have to, because the United States has $1.5 trillion in student debt, which is not going to be able to be paid, and it has to be like a huge bubble, which I believe will be, have to be forgiven. So what do you think about Chile? It's a different aspect. First of all, uh, the government starts to a campaign to, to, to show this reality if the, the people who have a debt pay, give the opportunity to others, to, to the students, to use the same resources. But the main focus for the government is get resources for the economy. Our economy is so sensitive to the external virus. For example, the, the rise of the price of the copper, and the government established a conditions, basic, basic conditions to get this goal in 2020. 
But with the economy our days, it's a little bit more difficult to get a goal in that time. And uh, they have asked the government to find a provision with this, but it's a proposal by the government hasn't do anything about it. So I have a question about, so all of this is happening within a incredibly different changing trend in Latin America as well. How do you see, I mean, Chile in a way has led a little bit, so a lot of the transitions and the shifts that have that have affected all the other Latin American countries, but for example, what's going on with Brazil right now, in terms of their involvement of populists and, the, and sort of in the middle class, and so in Chile also, and voicing more sort of their views. How do you see sort of the influencing, how do you see Chile within that scope, and how do you see sort of the environment in Latin America influencing what's going on in Chile, especially with the education? Um, Chile, what happened in 2006, it was followed for a lot of, of, of countries, and within the region, a lot of students kind of replied the same actions. And within the region, we could say that Chile is like the exception. Okay, you can see Argentina, Uruguay, uh, that in their constitution, the laws uh, state that the government is going to be the main guarantor of education. Like, it's literally there. Mm -hmm. But in Chile, if you see the constitution, it they literally says that there's going to be a freedom of teaching. What does that mean? That if you have the money and you have the, the power to create an educational system, you can. So it's like, it gives a lot of freedom for private institutions to be built, but our our neighbors, for example, uh, they see education as a right, whereas Chile is more as a um, commodity, mm -hmm. I could say. But regarding civil society or what happened there after this huge social, social movement in 2006, 2007, I could say it was like uh, a lot of different uh, Social movements started to be re replicated within the region, and also in Chile, uh, there were a lot of organizations, international organizations, that were supporting the, the students. What is the ratio between the younger generations and the older generations? Because it, since Chile is a democracy, votes count when you move forward with a social movement like this. Yeah, but the thing is that uh, most of the support from the government, most of the public funding, goes from pri for primary and secondary education. So we have very little of support from the government to higher education. So for example, since uh, Ricardo Lago's term, primary and secondary education is for free, but then uh, higher education is still highly privatized. Um, I'm just going to offer a slightly different perspective and see how you respond to that. So, um, in, in Laos, in quite a few low-income countries, like some middle-income countries, so Chile, of course, is well into the middle income, would say that from an overall societal perspective, governments uh, fund put too much money in higher education compared to primary and secondary education, and that, the, that people who go to college and most societies are already elites in their own societies, largely speaking, right? So sometimes you see that student-driven movements like this don't get a lot of sympathy from the overall population or from populists, etc., because they're saying these people are already the elites in our society, and we should invest less in higher education compared to other social investment purposes. Did, was this a problem at all happening the social movement? In Chile, and the fact that at the end you, you showed how some other groups of the population joined, they pledged their support for the students' uh, cause, but also joined their cause. And was that helpful in terms of broadening the coalition? So away from any perceptions of these are elites who are protesting about benefits that are denied to them. Uh -huh. If I uh understood well the, the first question. It was about a uh, this sense of uh, higher education that m most people can study there, like because uh, they're already paying for the... 
Well, more that the social movement might be at risk of a perception of that it's, it's a social movement driven by people who actually are quite privileged within their own societies. Was that a, a, an obstacle or not in Chile context? Yeah. Which I don't know. I mean, within the educational system, there is very little the, the privileged students that can afford that education. So from the universe of one million students studying there, most of them had huge debts. And this is why this is the, the main discussion of this issue. The access is guaranteed. Like, the government is going to give loans, the government is going to give uh, grants, but then it's up to the students to pay, to, to make a repayment of them. So there's, at least my point of view is that there's, it's not like a lot of privileged students, like three, four, I could say, of, of the of the K. Uh, we're talking about people of middle incomes that still they don't have enough money to afford the education, and if they are studying and they are graduating them and, and trying to find a job in order to pay for the education, they are not able to do it because they can be unemployed for a lot of years because the labor market also is not doing very well. But that is part of the, the pushback that some of the students social will be getting. Uh, listen, we're creating way too many educated people for which there is no labor market. So I'm just playing the devil's advocate in terms of some students social movements run into this problem that they're perceived to be complaining about things while there are much bigger social problems in society. Yes. That is an exception issue. Yes, and, and in that sense, the the main issue is that the system nowadays it allows that they like giving categories to people. So if, if they come from wealthy families, that is like a new percent of, of the people in Chile, they can afford their education. But I could say that most of the students come from middle income uh, families and they can't afford education. But yeah, it was like this discussion initially. But now, and with the other uh, associations and organizations, they all agree, I can say that the entire country agree that it has to be a right and it has to be an educational system supported by the government and not by the families. And that is by changing the constitution, by saying education is a right, but not a permission for entities, private corporations, to kind of start these educational initiatives as long as they have money. And um, yeah, I would say that it's a shared goal. Now everybody has pledged to that and, and it's seen as, as education as the cause of all the problems. Like drop out of students and if, if students are studying, for example, a lot of them are preparing to stay within the system and, and getting more debts rather than go out to the labor market because they know there's not going to be employment. So this kind of repayment for the loans is delaying every day. And I'm afraid we'll have to leave it right there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.